ganz herzlich willkommen allerseits zu diesem heutigen äh, Webinar, äh, Solidarity-Webinar zum Thema intramedulläre Schraubenostesynthese an Fingern und Mittelhandknochen, Indikationen, Tipps und Tricks mit äh, Dr. Maurizio äh, Calgani. Mein Name ist Claudia Darms, ich bin vom Education Department von der Medartis und ich werde den Dr. Calgani hier im Hintergrund unterstützen. Ähm, ganz kurz, Sie haben unten die Möglichkeit, während des Webinars äh, Fragen in das Chatfeld zu schreiben. Äh, die Fragen würde ich dann äh, dem Dr. Kalkani vorlesen und er wird sie gleich beantworten oder äh, je nachdem am Schluss dann. Und ansonsten für alle die, die den, die Videoübertragung äh, noch nicht beendet haben, darf ich Sie bitten, dies zu tun so dass wir bestmögliche Verbindung haben hier während dieses Webinars. Und jetzt freut es mich ganz besonders, Ihnen den Dr. Maurizio Calgani kurz vorzustellen. Er ist leitender Arzt und stellvertretender Klinikdirektor für die plastische Chirurgie und Handchirurgie am Unispital in Zürich. Und er ist der Generalsekretär der FESCH, der Federation of the European Societies for Surgery of the Hand seit 2017. Dr. Kalkani, vielen herzlichen Dank für Ihre Bereitschaft, heute Abend dieses Webinar zu halten. Es ist uns wirklich eine ganz große Freude und ähm, ja, ich gebe Ihnen sehr gerne das Wort. Vielen Dank für Ihre wertvolle Unterstützung. Thank you very much. I switch over to English. I think that we agreed to do it in English. If I remember properly and um, I will start with a case discussion. The Medartis uh, um, so structure offered a, po a possibility to make um, uh, online uh, votation about these cases so we are going to try I will show you four cases and uh, uh, we are going to start with uh, uh, the options that you might decide to, to use. So This is the first case and is a, is a young uh, lady who had a crush injury. This was a metal press who uh, crushed her hand. And uh, what kind of, um, uh, of treatment you would have uh, used? You should get the invitation to vote. So please vote. Good. Soll ich die Resultate freigeben? No, no, we are going to see them afterwards. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, good. Good. So now this is uh, the second case. This is um, a young chap who fell down from his mountain bike. He was uh, high speed uh, uh, downhill mountain biking and he uh, has this displaced uh, multifragmentary sub a capital fracture of a second metacarpal, what would you do? You can give the options out. Mm -hmm. uh, hold on. Hold on, now this is again number two. Yeah. And I have to. No, this is the result, okay. Okay, now case two, sorry. Now let's go, let's see, it's case two, yeah. What would you do? Please vote on this one. And you again can tell me when I can go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And uh, Here we have the third case, oh sorry, third case. This is a circular saw injury of um, um, a carpenter and uh, he has an, a lesion, as amputation of this finger and this op open fracture. What would be the solution for these three fractures, all open fractures? Is okay? Okay. Yeah. So, and this is the last one, last case. This is a, a, a bicycle again. 
there's a lot of people bicycle uh, on, um, now. And uh, we have this complex structure of uh, P1 of a small finger, dominant right hand. And uh, please give your options again the same. You tell me when it's okay. It, it's okay. Good. Thank you very much. So this we are going to see again these cases at the end of uh, of the presentation, and we are going to see if I was able to convince you uh, to um, uh, so to change your mind or to accept a new treatment option. So we move to the main talk, and uh, now. The, why should uh, uh, should we look for a different or new kind of fixation in in finger and metacarpal bones? The main problem is um, in the in the hand there is not enough space for everything, so it's very often you have impingement with gliding structures, mainly in the tendons, especially on the dorsal side of the hand, and but also on the palmar one, and. Um, when you, when you go for open uh, approaches, you have often um, big scars and, uh, and this might also lead to pain and late mobilization. If you take two uh, key papers, we, this is not the newest one, but they are key papers about complication in plate fixation, you see that um, most of the uh, most important problems were uh, adhesions and uh, restricted motion. If you look at this fracture, I treated many years ago with a, with a plate, and you see that the result is not bad. But from this uh, X-ray, you already realize that's an extension leg, and you see here the, oh, the result is not so bad, but you have an extension, extension leg. And you see the here, the skin, the rippling here and here, and this is a sign of adhesion. The scar is not moving over the plate. So the flexion is not bad, but extension is not as good as it should be. So in this, we were looking for something better. And um, looking at the past, we, we know that already in the 70s, uh, Guy Fouché, who was one of my teachers, teach, uh, he already found out that there were other options. And these other options were also uh, at those times to put something intramedullary. At those times there were uh, so different options. This one is a half screw, half pin, and he was fixing it with um, cyanoacrylate. Here this is a different kind of, uh, of nail because he didn't have any kind of, uh, of modern fixation. You see the evolution, it was this kind of screw, then it was a, this nail, this bilboquet is the one at the end he de decided to, to take. This, this slide is an original slide of Guy Fouché from the, the, his, his uh, collection. And this is one of his cases. And you can see that uh, his indication were mainly for uh, open fractures because of course he was not able to insert this pin uh, with a closed fracture and he was fixing it with this uh, oblique uh, in, um, um, wire. The function is nice, very good, but you see also 10 years afterwards, he still had his uh, steel pin in the, in, the, um, in the phalanx, which might also lead to problems. So um, then later, so you see in the mid, uh, so in the start in the 2010 and then this is the key paper in 2015 published by Paco Pignal. There, with new materials, we started to have the, the opportunity and the idea to, to fix these fractures with intramedullary screws and through a minimal invasive approach. And this is a major break breakthrough. Now I'm going to show you indications and our experience. You see here, we, we treat most of the finger fractures with this kind of, uh, uh, of fixation and also metacarpal, but very oblique and uh, spiral fractures cannot be fixed with this kind of, uh, of technique. The, all other can be fixed with this technique, sometimes in an easy way, sometimes in not so easy, but these two kind of uh, fractures cannot be uh, treated. So like in all techniques, there are limits and so if you're going to, to try to fix these, you're going to run into problems. So don't do it. 
first point is the screw choice. I don't have any royalties from Medartis. I don't get a, um, any kind of compensation, but I think that this screw is really by far the best I ever tried. The tip is really biting very well into the bone and it's very important because you don't need to drill. And no drilling is a major advantage because you don't have to pull out the drill bit and the purchase of the, of the screw in the bone is much better. And then the risk of a secondary displacement when you, when you take out the drill is very limited. You have to go inside with, uh, with, a, with, a dry, the, with a wire and the moment that the wire is there, you have just to put the screw on top of it. Usually we go for 2.2 uh, millimeter diameters, but when the medullary canal is bigger than three millimeter and always look in both, uh, in both planes, then you go for bigger screws. In some occasion, when the medullary canal, especially in, in the thumb, and sometimes also in the, fourth met, in the fifth metacarpal, is very, very broad, you might need even two screws to fill it uh, properly and have a good purchase of a screw in the, in the bone. Also, it's very important that you use adapted instruments. At the beginning, as you can see here on the right side of a, of a slide, the original screwdrivers were bigger than the size of a, of, a, of a head of a screw. So the moment you were pushing the screw below the surface of a, of a bone, it was ripping the bone apart. So Medartis developed thinner um, screwdrivers, which are smaller or the same size uh, of, a, of a screw head. So even if you bury the, the screw below the surface of a bone, you're not going to have any problem. The second important instrument that you, you find in the um, CCS set is this, uh, um, so this leaf. This was developed by Carlos Heras Palau. He's, uh, he's working in, uh, in Derby. And uh, the idea was not to slip on the surface of a scaphoid. But this is also very handy for our uh, purposes because in this way, you go into the base of a P1 or in the, in the head of a joint and you don't slip anymore. And uh, this is very sharp. You have to be careful because it has a sharp edge, so not to damage uh, tendons and nerves. But when, when you place it in a proper place, it doesn't slip and, and the wire goes where you want it to go and not where the bone is guiding it. So <clears throat> we have been... Um, Trying, we, we tried quite hard to find the best way to introduce it and we had a lot of discussion and uh, we are also very thankful to all the colleagues that criticized this technique in the past because we were able to, to make it better over time. And uh, one of the discussion we are going to come on uh, do, to discuss it again later on was to try to make the, the, the smallest uh, amount of damage to the joint surface. So, at the beginning, we tried to go from the base of the P1, in case of uh, P1 fractures, to, um, to, to, have, to use the broadest possible surface. The, the base is much broader than the, the head of a P1. For this reason, the, the damage, residual damage to the cartilage surface is going to be smaller. So what we did, what we do, try to do is to push up the P1 um, and then go above the head of the metacarpal and, and then to insert the guide wire and then the screw on top of it. Sometimes it's impossible and you have to go from distal or there is also a very good solution which was not invent invented by us but uh, was uh, originally published by Frederick Verstrecken for the um, fixation of a scaphoid you can go through the head of a metacarpal. And Frederick uh, described it to going through the um, trapezium to, uh, to fix the scaphoid. In this case, it's not really a problem because this position is very seldom, so you almost never have kissing lesions on both sides of the joint. Most of the time, this area of the joint is not loaded or not only partially loaded, and for this reason, is not very relevant. But you see here the, the canal into the head of a metacarpal bone. After the fixation, we go for a, a immediate mobilization like in all uh, uh, fixed fractures. And uh, we allow from progressive load from week three, depending on the fracture, of course, and depending on the X-rays. 
Um, in, some, in some occasion, you need compression bandages, as always, for, for, to reduce swelling. And we always have, in case of P1 fractures, uh, a, a, a splint, a night splint in, in a zero degrees position for, um, to prevent um, contracture in the PIP joint. Complications. Sometimes we have complications. This is one we had. One colleague, um, a little bit inexperienced, was uh, wanted to put the screw with maximum force and he broke the head during insertion. You see, maybe it was not very wise to choose a long thread because the, uh, the attrition, the friction here is very high. And so we could just retrieve the head of a, of a, of a, of a screw and we decided to play it on top of it. Other problems are screw protrusion. This is something that uh, is not very seldom. It can happen in elder people when you have a very soft bone and you have uh, just a collapse of the bone when the bone stock is not enough. And we had in some occasion, we are, going, we are collecting these cases, we are going to publish them. We had in some occasion protrusion of the, of the, of the screw in the MP joint. You see I'm very liberal in using uh, so these kind of screws also in partial fusions in the wrist because they are very handy, they are low profile, they, you can bury them and you don't have any kind of, uh, of material sticking out. Malrotation, you should always follow the rules of uh, osteosynthesis. Just because it's a single screw, there's no reason to build a malrotation inside. And also, we have to be very careful when you give uh, the load free. This patient, for example, got uh, this kind of fixation, everything went well, but at this point, he decided to go away and he never came back again until a few weeks ago. And uh, so six months after this uh, X-ray, he decided to hit again the, the wall because he was angry again and he uh, bent the screw. And this is also one question many, many colleagues asked me, what you do if you break the screw, or if you bend the screw and you have to do something again? Of course, living as it is is not an option. You have to, to take it out. And, uh, oh, sorry, here something happened. Uh, sorry. Um, and, uh, and what we, what you can do is just to cut the screw and you can take it nicely out. We, in this case, we, we took a little bit of uh, cancellous bone to fill the gap and we plated the fracture. So, Actually, it is possible to, to, to take out the screw even if it's broken or bent. And uh, as long as, um, as uh, you, you, can, uh, you can open it up again, you can take it out. Indications are the most important thing. We have now a very high, the very, very hot discussion about uh, uh, the value you can produce uh, for patients and uh, of course, when you decide to fix a fracture, you need to, to do something which is better than nature. And in this case, uh, you see that you have, is the ideal um, situation. You have compression, direct compression, you reduce the fracture, you put inside the screw and it's perfect. It heals by, uh, perfectly, like in this case. Sometimes you have a, a, a partial comminution, like in this case, and then instead of looking for, fixate for compression, so primary healing, you go for a kind of strutting. And this was, is a case of uh, heavily comminution, is a closed fracture, and we went for uh, internal fixation from proximal to distal, as you can see here, and this is the end result. You can see here callus formation on this side, on this side, that tells you that the patient had some, of, some motion at the at the fracture level, but this led to a nice uh, healing anyway. In these cases, of course, you should not look for compression. If you start compre com uh, uh, so compressing the fracture, then all the fragments are going to split out and uh, you end up with a big problem instead of solving one. Also in some other comminuted fractures, like in this uh, distal metacarpal one fracture with intraticular, intraticular fragment, it's important to study the fracture carefully and then decide. And of course here you have a lot of tendons, I don't have to tell you, you have uh, ligaments which have to glide freely. 
and the, the, the idea of putting all the hardware below the, the bone surface is very appealing. So we did a, a close reduction and we went for a double, a so-called uh, Y-shaped fixation that was described also by Marco Pignal in his original paper. And in this way, we went for uh, the main fixation of the biggest fragment. Again here, the first wire, the screw on the wire, and then the second one. And in this way, we also uh, took care of the intraarticular fracture. And you can see here there's a small irregularity which has no uh, functional uh, uh, significance. You can see here that is very nice um, healed. And the screws are below the surface of a, of a bone. You don't have to, uh, to, to go there and take them out. Oh, sorry. We, you can also treat open fractures, of course, as long as they are clean and you can uh, trust them. Again here, from proximal to distal, if possible, otherwise you can do is also the opposite. Here is very critical to, um, to, to look for the extensor tendon. The tendon here is very, very thin, and the screw is really very sharp. So if you fool around with the tip of a, of a, of a screw, you might damage the tendon. On the opposite here, uh, if you go through the soft triangles, you are not going to produce any damage. This is a case where a um, conservative treatment uh, was unsuccessful. The, the lady could not keep the reposition with a, with a um, uh, intringer, um, so treatment, the, the cast, the functional treatment, and we decided to, to fix it with a screw. Here, obviously, you can al also argue that might, probably a K wire would have done the, the job. This is true, but the, the screw is nicely uh, inside the bone, doesn't protrude, so you can start moving much faster, and, uh, and this, everything is inside, so you don't have any additional uh, concern in this way. This is a pathological fracture, and uh, we decided to, to clean it up, to fix it, and you see here again, we, uh, the position of a thread of a screw is nicely into cancellous bone and not in the grafted part. Here we did some sponges, uh, uh, some, uh, some cancellous bone um, grafting. And uh, again, here you don't look for compression, you look for strutting. Again, here, metacarpal fracture, multifragmentary, axial uh, compression screw. Here is an intraarticular fragment, and uh, this is the 3D uh, reconstruction. Again, mini open approach. Here you need to really see nicely that the, the, the shape of the bone is reconstructed. And you see here, probably we, we were a little bit too enthusiastic. We have here a very small irregularity, which here was not uh, uh, there, because a little bit of comp the compression produced a little bit of. Uh, of uh, squeezing of the bone and this slight uh, step off, which is not relevant in the end result. You see that you cannot see it anymore. Limits. Sometimes you have very, very good indication like this here. You have long screws holding it, even though it's not very much inside. But if you have an intraarticular comminution, they are not a good idea. They are going to push apart the two fragments and they are going to produce um, bigger problems. And sometimes you have easier solution. You don't always need to, to use a screw. Sometimes a K wire is more than enough and, uh, and much cheaper. Here, for example, is one indication where I'm not sure that is a good indication. You see here the, the fracture is quite proximal, and so you have to go inside very much to, to have purchase in the proximal fragment. We are discussing uh, with the company whether it would be possible to have longer screws in, a, in, in order to be able to not to go so much inside, because the, the speed of the advancement of these two threads is completely different. This is going very slowly, and this is going very fast. And for this reason means that this, this uh, thread here is ripping the bone from the inside. So the, the hold in the bone is much less than we would like to have. 
even though it heals at the end. Another um, discussion we had, and I mentioned before, it was the, the size of the defect we produce. And then what we did, we, get, we went into the lab, and this is a, a, a specimen where we reproduced the, the defect by drilling the, the screw into the, into the metacarpal head and in the base of a P1, and then we measured the surface. And as you can see here, depending if it's a 2.2 millimeter is 4% of the surface of a joint. And this is an assumption because this, the joint is curved, so it's a little bit more. And 8% if, uh, if the screw is a three millimeters. So this is very similar to the amount of damage you produce on the, on the proximal pole of a scaphoid. This, this um, picture I, I like to take here because it's very important. You see here, but when we go from, um, uh, from the metacarp from proximal to distal, you need to stay beside the tendon, between the central slip and the lateral uh, bands, uh, the lateral um, yes, uh, component. If you go in the middle, you break the tendon. And uh, I read some case reports of extension leg and tendon breakage with intramedullary fixation. Of course, if you go through the tendon and you make a three millimeters hole in this tendon, it has to break. So in what I always do, I make a small incision, I spread the skin and the subcutaneous tissue, and I go with a wire beside the main tendon in this soft area, and then I can I know that I'm not going to damage the tendon at all. The second uh, discussion we had uh, is is the intramedullary fixation strong enough to hold the the the, the, the forces of uh, of uh, rehabilitation, and the answer is yes. We we took the, the again uh, cadaver specimens to the lab and uh, we um, fixed with a plate and with different intramedullary screws. We used this machine in the Department of Biomechanics of the Federal Institute of Technology. And uh, you can see here the, the protocol of, uh, of the experiment. And we decided to use this 45 degrees position to reproduce at the best this cantilever uh, loading that is uh, normal in the, in um, in human uh, hands, and uh, you can see we have the pre-test situation of a plating, and then is the post-test situation. You see that if you if you push enough, one day you are going to rip the, the hardware out of the bone. So <clears throat> we decided to stop at this uh, moment, and this is the intramedullary screw. The same, you see, you have a, 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 a breaking of something, either the bone or the material. Here is a summary of what we found. These are below the Newtons, where the, the, the system broke. And here is the bending moment in Newton per meter. And you see that there is a significant difference. The plate is stronger than the screw, but this bending moment and the maximum load to breakage is very high in all cases. So <clears throat> it's, the construct is able to withstand the forces which are involved in uh, um, early rehabilitation, so immediate rehabilitation. So in conclusion, uh, here on the right side, you see some of the publications uh, coming out of our group is a safe technique. The fixation is stable, allows for early rehabilitation, is respectful to soft tissue, so you don't have impingement with gliding tendons and structures and things, and uh, makes the rehabilitation much easier. You don't have uh, K-wires through uh, gliding tendons, through the extensor uh, hood, but beware that not all fractures can be fixed with this kind of technique. As always, there are good indication uh, limit indication and no-go indication, as I mentioned before. Do not uh, uh, blame the, the material if something happens in, a, in the wrong indication. Thank you very much. And uh, I don't know if uh, there are some questions. 
I can answer at this moment. No questions so far. So, I'm oh, sorry, I have to. So maybe if no questions, nobody, any doubt? Hold on, there is a question coming up. How do you adopt the post-operative protocol compared to plate fixation? Well, we, we don't have to adapt it very much. The biggest difference is um, that you, can, you don't have uh, to bother with, this, with approach because you don't, it's a two, three millimeters incision, so you don't have to, to, to care for the skin. We go for an immediate unloaded motion. So they can move through active, no external force, active motion immediate, and a splint for the night. In the metacarpal bones, we have um, a metacarpal brace to protect the, and uh, mostly to remember to the patient that he cannot do everything, and uh, twin tape, so body taping between the fingers which are involved. For uh, P1 fractures, normally is a, a, as a rest splint from the night and a twin tape, so body taping for the motion, <laughs> motion during the day. Then another question coming up. Uh, when would you remove the materials, for example, after one year, even if they don't cause complication? Never. I never take out material that is not making problems neither a plate nor a screw. Because taking out the material doesn't make so much of a sense. Um, if the patient is going to have again an injury which is strong enough to make a new fracture, the high, so if the bone is intact, so heal, not like in the other one who, who had a non-union or a delayed union, uh, then is going to break away from the screw and if the screw might bend then you still have uh, the possibility to take it out. We only take um, metal away that is disturbing. The, the, the risk of making a nerve injury or some kind of problem is too high. It's fishing for complications. Okay, then another question. What is the best screw length for shaft oblique fractures? Well, it should be a very short oblique because as I said, I don't like to use oblique in a very, very steep oblique fractures is not a good indication. But uh, <clears throat> the idea is to keep the head in the subchondral uh, cancellous bone and have a distal thread in the isthmus of the metacarpal bone. So where is, is uh, the narrowest point? So you have a, the best hold in the bone. I don't like to, to push too much down underneath the bone surface, the, the screw. And uh, sometimes you are obliged to do that. And uh, I'm not sure if it's really a very good idea. And the absolute length, often I, we had to take the, the longest, which is, Herr uh, Alge, uh, you can tell better what is the maximum length. I don't remember whether it's 40 or 38 or 36. Anyway, then um, uh, somewhere there, you take the longest. Otherwise, what we do, because you cannot really measure properly, you, you put under the um, image intensifier the screw beside the fracture and you can judge the length. There's another question coming up. Would you use absorbable screws material, magnesium? Yes and no. Um, I tried uh, in the lab and uh, they don't have the same um, um, strength. The problem is very, you have to drill because uh, they are not self-perforating, uh, so self-drilling. And because the shaft uh, um, is not strong enough to withstand the torsional forces. And um, this is one reason. And second reason is that you don't have any control over resorption they have a huge reaction, which might be not so relevant inside the bone, but nevertheless, you have a lot of reaction. You have also bone resorption around the screws. So I'm not very fond of this kind of fixation. 
Okay, and then here's coming up the answer to your question regarding the screw length. It's 30 millimeter with a short thread and 40 millimeter with a long distal thread. Exactly. And that's why I was remember properly is 40. I wanted to, well, we, we, we would like to have 50 to 60 to, to manage all the metacarpal bone problems. Might come one day. Okay, now a very interesting question coming up. You said in some cases compression is not desired. How do you handle not to compress with the compression screw? The, you stop. Because what, what happens is that uh, the, you get compression only if you, if you countersink the head of the, of, the, of the screw. What happens is if you just take it below the level of the bone, you have very, very small compressions and you have to stop. And the more you advance, the more compression you get. So if you just put the head below the level of bone, you have a minimal compression and then you have to stop. Okay, <clears throat> no more questions so far. Uh, so, another question, yeah. sorry. Do you have already representable results? Plate versus intramedullary screw in simple metacarpal fractures regarding the improved motion due to less adhesions? Uh, yes and no. We, are, uh, we already published our first results uh, after um, three years. We are uh, um, going to present, all the patients have been uh, already um, reviewed, but the paper is not written, so it's going to come out of our five years results. And we are launching uh, our uh, main uh, uh, revision of cases revision. We don't have a prospective uh, randomized trial, and, uh, but we hope, we, we think that we can uh, look at the reoperation rate uh, on to the number of um, uh, tenolysis and be able to demonstrate that against the historical data. We, we have a registry now, we are setting up the registry now for osteosynthesis and this is going to give us uh, a prospective um, view uh, of, the, of everything but is is not that far at the moment. Another question coming up, what is your rate of fracture non-union using this method? I cannot say you, uh, but I had to look for the worst cases to show. So, it's, so I don't know, I, I, I have in my head uh, with a good indication, I have this one who rebroke and that is more a delayed union than a non-union and uh, it was uh, an adequate uh, trauma, so the, the, it's a refracture probably. And um, otherwise it's very low. What we have is in some elder patients, when, when the, in fixation of a base of a proximal fracture of a P1, sometimes the bone stock is not strong enough and we have uh, a, a, a resorption, a small resorption of the bone and then it collapses and, and then, it's, uh, then we have uh, more a malunion than a, than a nonunion. Then we have to take the screw out. But it's really anecdotal that we have nonunion. But as I said, we are reviewing uh, in, uh, in a proper way our statistics, also our cases, and I don't like to give numbers like this, but it's a very, very low um, percentage. Okay, that's it so far. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> okay. Have you seen loss of reposition due to malrotation? Yes. In we we in a, in a certain time we tried to push the indications, and I'm well. We we are going to see also in the case discussion. There are limits. Okay. But I think that is really a matter of indication. If you have a huge medullary canal, then you need to have enough metal inside to keep the reposition. If it's very oblique, then you need something uh, different. So, and uh, sometimes you might accept compromises, but it's dangerous. I don't like to, to, to accept too many compromises. Maybe we can go through the cases. It's already quarter past six. Yes. And uh, I 
try to show you again with case one, you can uh, vote again. Oh, hold on, no, this is the, the this is the wrong one. Yeah, please. Uh, case one. Yes, let's go. Oh, sorry. You tell me when I can go ahead. Okay. 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 Yeah. Then case two. What would you do in this case? Again, is isolated supercapital uh, fracture, high energy. You, I don't have it. Okay, yeah. So should I go ahead with a case three? Yeah. Yes. This is again, this uh, circular saw injury with many phalangeal fractures. Okay. And then this is the fourth. This is this spiral multifragmentary with intraticular. Okay. Yeah. So then we can go ahead and have a solution. Maybe you can show us the, the um, percentage of a case one. I don't know if, if you can show us or you, did you send me the results? You already have them? Um, just a second. Okay, yes. Okay, first round. First round, case one. Cast splint, 6%, KYS 21, plates 42, intramedullary screws 31. Yeah. So you can see here, we decided to go for three different uh, fixation. This here was too comminuted to be fixed and too unstable. So we had to go for a plate. This one was very limited displacement and it was very distal. And in this case, in these two central metacarpal, we, we went for um, intramedullary screw and all um, uh, fractures uh, healed uneventfully. The, the one who took the longest was the plated one. So probably we, we should have taken also in this one uh, intramedullary screw. And this is the only metal we had to take out. The, the better we have to operate again. This one we took in local anesthesia. You see, the wire was uh, through the skin, so we, could, we took it out without an, um, operating. And these two screws, you can see, the very nice healing. Second case. Second case. I I will write it in the chat so you can everybody can see it in the chat. So this means cost would be no zero percent. KY is nineteen plates, fifty four, and intramedullary screws twenty seven. So I was not very successful to convince you to use screws, but uh, we we actually went for 
this Y-shaped um, fixation. And uh, these, these small fragments are not relevant. And uh, the, we got a very, uh, sorry, I don't have, uh, this is a quite fresh fracture. We had a very nice reposition and fixation. And he has a very good motion. So this is a good example of uh, Y-shaped fixation. This screw is the first one you insert, and this one blocks uh, the compression also. So you cannot go uh, further down. And this is a good way also to block uh, rotation. So you don't have any kind of uh, malunion, but all uh, of rotational malunion that can, can go inside. Third case. Would you... Um... Dr. Kaljani, would you like yeah. to make the comparison right away? Yes. Between the first round and the second round. These are, now, these are now the numbers of the first round. Uh, okay, sorry. Yes, you can... Uh, you so, can in, sh shall I just mention also that the, in the second round, how, was, how it was changed? Yeah. Then you can have a comparison here. So in the second round, you had 17 instead of 19 for KYS, plates almost half, only 24, and wow. intramedullary screws 59. So you were able to convince them. But I'm relieved a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we can go to case three. Yes. So case three, this, these are the results from the first round. 50 for KYS, 25 plates, 25 intramedullary screws. And if you have more questions, do not hesitate to send. Okay, fantastic. So and I think that the yeah. 10 of the K wires are going down. Plates yeah. are more or less the same number and uh, there's a switch from K wires to medullary screws. And Absolutely. Indeed, we went for this kind of uh, fixation. Uh, this, this finger here was not um, uh, reprintable and uh, we, we had this kind of fixation. You see here, it's very important that the, the thread is fully on the other side of the fracture line. Here, the purchase is very short because the lever it was short, the fragment is not very big, but this is the best quality of bone. So you should not be concerned. If you get the full thread, over the fracture line in this area, then the, you see that the, the healing is uneventful. You see that the axe is very nice and in all planes. And the last case. The last case here you can see K wires 2%, plates 83, and the intramedullary screws with 15%. Yes. This is the first round. Let me just give you uh, the second. So here you can see plates went down to 71 and the intramedullary screws went up almost to double to 29%. Yes, but here somebody asked before about uh, about the secondary displacement. This is a very nice case. I love it very much. You can see here it was not possible to go from proximal to distal because the, the base was split. So we had to go in from the distal part to the proximal one. And then uh, we used compression screws to take uh, care of this split in the base. Nevertheless, and you see here the, the situation is absolutely nice. At, at the end of operation, you need to be aware that you have to start with the axial screw and then you can fix the other one. And as long as you don't have these compression screws, you should keep this reposition uh, clamp. Otherwise, uh, the fragments are going to split away. But you see, this we had a secondary dislocation. This screw, th this fracture was too oblique and we had a little bit of extension deformity. At the end, the, 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 the fracture healed but you can see here, you have something like 20 degrees or 25 degrees of angulation, which is not optimal. So probably this is an elegant, minimal invasive fixation of this fracture, but it was a little bit uh, aggressive for an indication. 
Thank you very much. One last question, and then we can go home. <coughs> so okay. if you don't have any question, I thank you very much for participating for this webinar. Thank you also very much to Medartis for giving us the chance to exchange our uh, ideas on this topic. And uh, hopefully we are going to meet again live uh, in some meetings. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Gargani. Thank you.